Good morning. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Before I begin, I am starting out with this announcement for those attendees that are hearing impaired and would like to attend our webinars. VA is in the process of having closed caption incorporated into this platform. In the meantime, if you would like the link to the recording for this presentation, that would include closed captioning in the Q&A box type CC. Due to the manual process that is required to create the closed captioning, the link will be provided to you within 48 hours via the email address you use to register for this webinar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the executive director, VA Osdevu, Mrs. Sharon Ridley, the deputy executive director, Mrs. Kimberly Osborne, and the DAPSOC director, Mrs. P. Antoine Brockton, thank you for attending today's FSS webinar. Osdebu will continue to leverage the efficiency of technology to provide timely and relevant information to small businesses. The department recognizes small businesses bring to the table the advantages of flexibility, generally lean staffing, and invigorating entrepreneurial spirit. As a vital aspect of our supply chain, small businesses help us serve our nation's veterans with honor by using the qualities I mentioned earlier. So thank you for attending today and best wishes with your future business pursuits. I'm Curtis Brandon and joining me today are my colleagues, Wendy Bray and Nicole Hines, along with two special guests. This training is being recorded. The training as well as today's presentation will be emailed to you by this afternoon. Please note that the Q&A box on, our, on your panel. Please add any questions you have here. During this webinar, my colleagues will be responding to them. There will also be a question section at the end of this session to ensure we address all questions presented. As a reminder, when submitting a question, please send to all presenters so that your question is not missed. At the end of this webinar, a survey window will appear. We ask that you please take the time to complete it. Your responses will be used as a part of our continuous service improvement efforts. And I want to say to the veterans who are in attendance, thank you for your service. The Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, OSDABU, supports the Secretary's mission by maximizing the participation of procurement ready veteran owned small businesses by a few ways. So, for example, developing policies and programs, as well as improving market research. OSDABU also assists non veteran owned small businesses with respect to doing business with the VA. We are vets first, but not vets only. Osdebu has six program areas. I'm in the Office of the Strategic Outreach and Communication, also known as SOC. So SOC provides awareness of VA small business programs and resources, small business goals, and training to firms interested in doing business with the VA. This is achieved by providing a communications platform, education and training, and distrib distribution of information through focused and targeted outreach to help promote understanding of VA small business programs and support opportunities. So now we'd like to introduce our guests, Mrs. McCoy Stevens and Mrs. Lydia, Lydia McKay from the National Acquisition Center. Thank you for that introduction, Curtis. Um, can you um, transition to the next slide? Thank you. So how to obtain a VA FSS contract? This is a beginner's level course. Uh, there is another course available and stay tuned for more information concerning that course. Next slide. So today's presentation will cover how to obtain a VA FSS contract. The agenda will cover the following. We'll provide an overview of FSS, who we are and what we do. We'll provide information that will help you determine if FSS is right for you. We'll go over the steps in obtaining an FSS contract. We'll go over what is contained in the solicitation documents. We'll describe the review and award process will inform you of your responsibility as the contractor. And last but not least, 
we'll provide you with some helpful resources. So, uh, so first, let's discuss a little background on FSS. So you might know us uh, referred to as schedules or mass. Sometimes you hear people refer to us as GSA schedule. So let's uh, let's correct some of that that information. So federal supply schedule is a government wide program acquisition program. GSA established it back in 1960. And they delegated the VA the authority to manage all of the healthcare related products and services, all the schedules for healthcare related products and services. So essentially, there are VA federal supply schedules, which are the healthcare related ones, and then GSA manages all of the other federal supply schedules. Um, so basically, there's VA FSS and GSA FSS. And all of these schedules are for commercial products and services, things that are already out there in the, in the commercial marketplace, and they're all multi-year contracts. Right now, we have uh, nine schedules with about 1,700 contracts with over a million products and services. And all of our solicitations have no closing date. They're all open and continuous. So this helps enhance competition because we have new people entering the marketplace all the time. Um, pricing is kept fresh. When we look at sales under our schedules, I want to point out that um, it's not just federal agencies that can buy off of federal supply schedule contracts, but whenever the Stafford Act is invoked, that's when the, when the president declares a national emergency, it opens up schedule purchasing to state and local governments. So, of course, right now, because of COVID, state and local governments are also eligible to uh, place orders against our federal supply schedule contracts. So in fiscal year 2020, we had sales of $15.5 billion. So if we break that down, um, the biggest chunk of that went uh, was purchased by the VA, $10.1 billion in sales. All the other government agencies put together were $5.4 billion. And then we had $13 million in sales with state and local governments. So now let's talk about our nine FSS schedules and how we can meet the government's health care needs. So here you see a sample floor plan of a health care facility. So first here you see our 652A medical equipment and supply schedule in fiscal year 2020. And all the figures you're going to see here are fiscal year 2020. Over $1.3 billion in sales under that schedule. Here's our 66.3, that's our uh, clinical laboratory analyzers cost per test schedule and our 65 part seven um, testing and analysis services schedule. We have 260 million on one and 123 million in sales during fiscal year 2020 for that those schedules. A pharmaceutical schedule over almost 13 billion in sales on that schedule. Our x-ray schedule 65.5A. It's our smallest schedule, just a little over 3 million on that schedule. Our 652C dental equipment and supply schedule. A little over 70 million in sales under that schedule. Our 6212 uh, medical laboratory testing and analysis services schedule. We also call that our reference lab schedules, 123 million in sales under that schedule. Our 652F patient mobility schedule, 200 and almost 209 million. And then lastly, here we have our 621I professional healthcare, professional and allied healthcare staffing services schedule, also called our temporary staffing services schedule. Uh, 441 million in sales there. So now let's take a closer look at each one of these schedules. So here's our 65MB pharmaceutical schedule. And that first bullet there, what you see are some of the categories of products that are included under this schedule. So when we talk about the categories of products that are included under a schedule, they're called SINs, S-I-N, special item numbers. 
So these special item numbers are broad categories of products and services. So think think of SINs as chapters in a in a product category. Uh, I'm sorry, product catalog or category filters on a on a shopping site. So these are like broad categories of products. So for the 651B schedule, there's prescription drugs as well as over the counter drugs, but it also includes things like human blood products, medicated cosmetics, dietary supplements, and even antiseptic soaps and dispensing equipment, which right now we know are um, very prevalent in the marketplace. Currently, we have about 465 contractors under the schedule with a little over 14,000 uh, line items that are awarded under that schedule. Our 65 a schedule, it has nearly 100 product categories or 100 cents special item numbers under that schedule. And they, they run the gamut of anything from bandages and latex gloves, small items like that, surgical sponges, to more complex items like medical diagnostic instruments and wound drainage systems. Currently, we have 746 contractors under that schedule with about a half million line items being awarded. Our 652C dental equipment and supply schedule. The SIN categories under that includes things like hand instruments, lab equipment, um, operatory items, orthodontics, dental x-ray materials. We have a separate schedule that's for general, general x-ray, um, but teeth, dental furniture, things like that. We have 58 contractors under that with over 104,000 line items awarded. Here's our patient mobility schedule, 652F. The special item number categories, the SIN categories, includes wheelchairs, and that's different kinds of wheelchairs. So that's manual wheelchairs, your powered wheelchairs, sports wheelchairs, things like that. But it also includes things, other types of mo mobility devices like scooters and walkers and canes and crutches. It includes ramp systems um, for, for going into the home with wheelchairs, shower aids, like grab bars and things like that. It also includes vehicle transport lifts, so um, things that can be added on to a to a car to help move the the wheelchair, the patient into the vehicle. We have 128 contractors under that schedule with almost 36,000 line items. Now this is our smallest schedule, which probably in the near future will be absorbed into our 652 way medical equipment and supply schedule. That's our biggest of the commodity schedules. Um, over time, obviously, when things have gone digital and um, some of the, the products and technologies of, um, we have less line items, less contractors, so it makes sense to not have it as its own schedule. But right now it still is its own schedule. Um, we have currently have nine contractors, a little over 7,000 line items. And that's your digital X, traditional and digital X-ray products, film equipment, even film-related products like the illuminator viewers, processors, as well as the protective equipment, hangers and lead aprons and shields and things like that. 65 part seven, this is our in vitro diagnostic reagents, test kits, and test sets. So the SIN categories under this schedule, we actually have 11 SIN categories, but it includes things like blood bank, chemistry, hematology, phlebotomy, glucose monitoring. Um, so uh, normally glucose monitoring devices would fall under a 65 to a medical equipment um, and supply schedule, but it posed a problem that the um, actual equipment, uh, the, the monitoring device itself was on our 65 to a schedule, while the test strips and, and, and reagents and things were on this schedule. So essentially, a contractor would need to have two separate FSS contracts, one for each schedule to have all their items, and it made it problematic for our ordering facilities when they had to look under two schedules, two separate contracts to buy one solution. So we did move all of the um, actual devices from the 65-2A schedule to this 65 part seven schedule. So anything to do with the glucose monitoring, both the devices and the, the test strips and controls and things are all included on this one schedule. So that was a big help to everyone. Currently we have 34 contractors with a little over 10,000 line items. So this is the first you see here of our services schedules. Uh, we usually just refer to as temporary staffing, but it's our professional and allied healthcare staffing services schedule. 
Now, the sin categories that you see listed here, these are labor categories. Things like physicians, paramedics, dentists, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, nurses, dietitians, chiropractors. And um, you'll see there's 242 contractors with representing 4,313 line items. Now, the line items here, of course, would be the labor categories that were awarded under each one of these, uh, each one of these schedules. Now, we wanna talk just a little bit more about the 621I schedule since it's, um, it's quite unique. So the, the price that gets awarded is the hourly rate, and that hourly rate is awarded as a not to exceed price. And that's for the labor categories and for the, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the location that's awarded. So under this schedule, um, it's the only schedule where nationwide coverage is not required. Um, if the company is able to prove they can have nationwide coverage, then they can be awarded nationwide coverage. Otherwise, they are permitted to do state by state coverage or even regional coverage. And the way these not to exceed rates are awarded is if they're, uh, is nationwide coverage under that schedule, then there'll be one not to exceed rate that's based on the highest price location nationally. So if say San Francisco is the highest possible location in the US for that particular category, then that would be the not to exceed rate. Um, if someone's doing state by state or regional coverage, perhaps it's like the Midwest area and Chicago, Illinois is the highest um, price potential location. Therefore, the not to exceed rate would be based on this hourly rate for Chicago, Illinois. But keep in mind that at the task order level, when, when facilities are ordering against these schedules, they have to examine what are the rates that are appropriate for their specific location. So while we may have awarded a not to exceed rate for Chicago, Illinois, if the placement is in, you know, out in the country in downstate Illinois, obviously that rate would not apply. So the ordering activities are competing and looking for the rate that that fits their specific location. It's just that these not to exceed rates would be the highest rate um, potentially possible to be awarded um, against one of the FSS contracts. So I wanna point out this uh, red note you see here at the bottom. So because of all these COVID price-based fluctuations and the high demand for nurses and other types of um, medical professionals, we are temporarily permitting what we're calling a market differential that can be added to the not to exceed rate. Um, that has to be specifically justified on a case by case basis by whoever the contract officer is at that ordering activity. There are mass modifications um, incorporating this language into each of our 621I contracts right now. It's mass mods 10 through 14. So if you needed to take a look at that, um, there'll be a hyperlink here in our in this slide that can let you see about that, um, that market differential. Right now, uh, mass mod 14 runs it through the end of this year. So potentially we'll be issuing another mass modification to extend the, the market differential. The reason you see 10 through 14 was due to extensions over time to keep that market differential in place as, as COVID's still having an impact on the, on the industry. And the second of our of our services based schedule is 6212 what we call reference labs medical laboratory testing and analysis services. Now, this schedule is where doctors offices clinics and hospitals they'll obtain patient patient specimens and then they'll send these off to be tested by a contracted lab. So, the pricing that gets awarded under this schedule, um, the test pricing is all inclusive. It includes the pickup of the specimens by the contractor. The whatever um, packaging has to be put around that that test sample to get it to the to the contractor, the actual testing of the specimens, and then finally a return of the test result to the ordering activity. So it's start to finish for that for that test. Um, so the testing categories that are included, some of them are you'll see here clinical chemistry, clinical drugs of abuse, toxicology, hematology, microbiology, urinalysis. We show we have 27 contractors right now. Uh, we're not showing an item count because some of our contractors have um, awarded pricing that's tiered. 
So it makes it difficult for us to give an actual count of test types offered because the same test would be offered multiple times under different, different pricing tiers, volume tiers. The last of our schedule, it is considered a commodity schedule, is our 66.3 cost per test clinical laboratory analyzer schedule. And we usually just refer to this as cost per test. Now this schedule, uh, the, the line items that get awarded are the actual tests, but that test price includes the lease price of the analyzer machine all rolled up into the per test price. Um, so it's another all inclusive type, uh, type thing. So the types of analyzers we have under the schedule include immunochemistry, chemical, coagulation, hematology, microbiology, and urinalysis. We have 17 contractors under the schedule, but again, we're not showing the um, item count. Um, there's a lot of complex tiered or volume pricing and test mix pricing involved with the schedule, so it's, we're not able to have an item count here. The, the awarded prices and tests are actually published as configured price lists for this schedule. So that way people can see the layout of these, of these mixes or volumes or tiered pricing. So this slide here is just a, everything, in, everything in one slide. These are all of our nine schedules, the schedule number and the schedule name listed on one slide so you can see it all there together. We have five contracting teams that manage our nine schedules. And our med surge teams A and B, they manage our 652A, 652C, and 652F schedules. Our pharmaceutical teams A and B, they we have two teams under that um, that category as well. Manage our 651B, 652C, and 65 Part 7 schedules. And then our services team manages our 621I, 621N2. And then even though 66.3, um, our cost per test is technically a commodity schedule, that is also managed by our services team. So I will now turn it over to McCall to talk about the benefits of FSS. Okay, thank you, Lydia. So what are some of the benefits of being an FSS contractor? So, um, when comparing open market contracting to scheduled contracting, we'd like for you to know the advantage, advantages of being an FSS contractor. So please go to the next slide. Thank you. So price. Awarded prices are competitive with FSS commercial market pricing. When we award contracts at FSS, contracting officers make sure that prices are competitive and include FOB destination. Quality. Contracting officers make sure that contractors receiving awards have expert knowledge and are responsible. So another benefit is speed. Schedule contracting over an open market contract can offer your customers reduced acquisition costs and lead time and prices that are already determined to be fair and reasonable. And last but not least, choice. VA FSS schedule contracts offer more than a million commercially available medical equipment, supplies, and services. Our solicitations are open and continuous. You can reply to a solicitation at your convenience. I'm turning it back over to Lydia. Oh no, I'm sorry. So let's take a closer look at this slide, slide 23. Um, if we look at schedule 65-2A, that's our medical equipment and supplies. So as you can see, the total sales for medical equipment and supplies for fiscal year 2020 is $1.3 billion. Of that amount, 
43% of that dollar amount went to small businesses. And if you look further down on the same line, if you look at, look at the veteran-owned small business percentage, that's nearly 18%. If you round up, it is 18% of those dollars were awarded to veteran-owned small businesses. That is the only example I, I wanted to go over, but you will get a copy of the slides and you can go into further details and examine the total sales for each of the schedules. And you can see where your business fits in and determine the, the appropriate share. So next slide, Lydia. Is that is FSS right for you? Yes. Yeah, so now, thank you. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, so when we talk about assessing need, the first thing you want to assess, um, is is there a need for your products and services? And so here are some things that you're going to want to consider. So you're going to want to search the contract opportunities and contract data parts of beta.sam. Gov. Um, contract opportunities, that's the section of that website where government agencies post procurement opportunities and requests for information. Uh, all of this used to be posted on FedBizOps. Now um, it's been transitioned a couple years ago to beta.sam. And then the contract data section of beta.sam is where government reports its actual spending. So you can actually see how and where the money was spent. That used to be published in FPDS, um, but a lot of things are being moved to this one beta.sam platform as a, as a good central point to go to for a lot of a lot of information. The other thing to look at when assessing your need, you'll see the link there, the schedule sales query. That's where you can review historical sales information for federal supply schedule contracts. So when you do your research on these two websites, you want to ask yourself these questions. Is there a need for your products or services? Which agencies have purchased your products and services? Where are they located? What was the price of those sales? Looking at all these things to consider where, uh, if there's a need for your, your particular products and services. But you also have to consider product restrictions. Um, one of the first things is the scope of the schedule. So we talked about these special item number categories, these SIN categories, those predefined uh, categories of products. So for every schedule, every solicitation, it's going to list what these predefined SIN categories are. So your product or services have to be able to fit under one of these predefined SIN categories. So don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole. You know, your products truly need to fit under one of these categories in order to be eligible for one of our contracts. If you're unsure about the fit of your products under a category, you can always reach out to our help desk with scope questions. At the end, we'll be providing resources and, and give you that information. The second big thing you have to consider under scope is, can you provide domestic coverage? We might also call that nationwide coverage. Now, there's a specific definition in the solicitation of what domestic coverage entails. That means the 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, and US territories. So perhaps you're a dealer or distributor that can only provide coverage um, to a certain region, um, certain states, you would not be eligible for an EPSIS contract because you have to be able to provide full domestic coverage. Um, the only exception for that is our 621I temporary staffing schedule, which does permit regional and state by state coverage. The next thing you see there is commercial items um, based on GSA's regulations. FSS schedules are for the award of commercial items. So test number one is, does your product meet the definition of a commercial item? And you can see the link there to FAR 2.101. Um, now, when you go to that definition, it's quite a lengthy definition and very, very multi-layered. Um, 
And you'll see a section there in the definition section where it talks about modified commercial items. So, while the definition of a commercial item does provide for modified commercial items, we specifically, our schedule solicitations do not permit certain types of um, modified commercial items. We've made a policy decision not to accept what we call custom packs or custom items that are made to individual specifications. Um, examples of items made to individual specifications might be custom teeth products um, or custom orthotics, not like the over-the-counter orthotics where you can just order this kind of orthotic like Dr. Scholl's or whatever we're talking about where the doctor would make take a mold of someone's foot and, and then have a custom orthotic made. Uh, when we talk about custom packs not being permitted, um, sometimes um, a company might offer a pack that, for example, um, a surgical pack. So this particular pack includes the instruments a doctor needs to perform this particular type of surgery. So if this custom pack in that configuration is sold commercially, that's fine. But if it's, but if it's a custom pack made just for the government, um, it's not sold commercially. Maybe this hospital prefers this type of instrument over that type of instrument in the pack, and that's not how the company normally sells it commercially. We wouldn't permit that. So um, in those cases, um, custom packs are custom packs are not permitted. Standard packs are, but custom packs are are not permitted. So a couple more product restrictions. Uh, here you see Federal Acquisition Regulation Clause 52.225-5 trade agreements. So for this clause, this restriction, you wanna ask yourself, are your products either US made or are they designated country end products, which is required by this clause? Now the clause will provide the criteria on what constitutes US made. It has a definition and what the criteria is. The clause also provides a list of what constitutes a designated country. And what that means is that the country of origin of your products or services must be one of these desert, listed designated countries if it's not U.S. made. But don't confuse country of origin with country of manufacture or country of export. They are not one and the same. They potentially could be one and the same, but not necessarily. Country of origin is actually determined by the country of substantial transformation of that product. So, for example, if an item consists of components from different countries, and maybe they're assembled in another country, the tests determine that country of origin of that product, since there's multiple countries involved, is what's called substantial transformation. Now, when it comes to services, the country of origin is actually determined by the country in which the firm providing the service is established, not the location at which the services are being performed. If you're unable to determine um, the country of substantial transformation for your product, you know, there's a lot of layers to it. You can always go to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP Office of Regulations and Rulings to get a, uh, to get a determination on that. So now I'll turn over to Nicole to finish up the Is FSS Right For You section. Thanks, Lydia. So when, term when determining if FSS is right for you, a key component is assessing the competition. So one of the ways you can assess competition is market research. This can be done by using the NAC contract catalog search tool we call it the CCST. The CCST allows potential vendors to see all the products and services available through FSS. Potential contractors can also search GSA eLibrary for contract award information and GSA Advantage for access to everything offered by GSA. So when determining if FSS is right for you, you must look at both price and non-price related factors, such as delivery times and warranty terms. Next slide. Okay, the VA awards contracts to responsible companies at fair and reasonable prices. And that is determined by looking at the most favorite customer pricing, commercial market pricing, and current awarded FSS contract pricing. Next slide. 
We also want you to be aware of some post-award responsibilities. You have to be able to meet the contract minimum of $25,000 in annual government sales. You also have to meet the requirements of the solicitation, both pre-award and post-award. And last but not least, you have to have the time and resources to dedicate towards administering and marketing your contract after the award. Next slide. So the steps to obtaining an FSS contract. Next slide. You have to take the GSA Pathway to Success course. And after that course is successfully taken, you download the solicitation and complete all the required documents, including obtaining the DUNS number and registering at SAM.gov. The DUNS number um, will be phased out soon and you'll be required to get a unique identification uh, number. So step number three is you submit your proposal via email to our uh, at this address, vafssoffers at va.gov. Be sure to visit our electronic acceptance of FSS offers webpage for complete details on the submission format and logistics. You want to be timely and complete in your response to a request for information that you'll receive from your contract specialist. They might ask questions or request additional information or just clarification. And you have to be ready to negotiate your best offer for a successful FSS contract award. I'm turning it over to Lydia McKay for the solicitation documents. Okay, so let's take a look at how we get these solicitation documents and what they entail. So, first thing I want to do is point you to this red note at the bottom, because normally um, solicitations would all be at beta.sam. Used to be on FedBizOps, now they're on beta.sam. But we had a lot of issues when FedBizOps transitioned to beta.sam, a lot of interface issues. So, uh, we're not uh, on our website, we're not providing links to the solicitation on beta.sam because they're incomplete. Some things didn't post properly. So, right now, um, and I'll demonstrate this the, the individual VA schedules web pages will, um, will provide a zip file of the solicitation and any amendments that you'll need. So, everything's going to be on there. Right now, only 621i currently links to the solicitation at beta.sam. As we refresh each of our solicitations um, on the new beta.sam platform, um, slowly those um, those schedule web pages will then refer you to the, the beta.sam web page instead of including a zip file. But right now that's our that's our fix for it. Um, so you always want to make sure you obtain the most recent solicitation by following the links on our VA schedules web page. Because you can go to beta.sam and query a, um, a solicitation and find a solicitation on there. However, at, whenever we refresh our solicitations, the old solicitations are still would still show up in the search. So you wanna make sure you're not getting the wrong version of the solicitation. So um, you're, you need to go to our VA schedules webpage to, uh, to see this. So I just went to that link. This is our VA schedules webpage. And so you'll see each one of our schedules and there's a hyperlink right here, this takes you to that specific schedule web page. So if we click on 652A, it will take us to that schedule web page. Each schedule web page is laid out the exact same way. So if you scroll down, um, there's like FSC codes. Um, these are the maximum order thresholds, um, NAICS, NAICS codes, but there's always this section called the solicitation and if you click here, download, that's where you'll get all the solicitation documents. And again, once we get 
um, each schedule refreshed, instead of it having a link to download, it would link you to the solicitation documents on beta.sam. But if we go back to that main VA schedules program page, you'll see what revision number we're on. So, for example, we just refreshed 621I. So, it's right now revision 4, we call it R4. Um, whenever we refresh a, a solicitation, we do give a grace period on how long you can still submit the old solicitation version because, you know, it'd be a disservice if you spent all this time submitting, you know, working on your proposal and fixing all your documents, um, only to find out that the day before or the day after another solicitation refresh version comes out and you, you shouldn't have to start over. So there's always a, um, a grace period of 90 days under which we'll still accept the, the old uh, solicitation version. So if there is a grace period, you'll see. So, for example, this one, I released revision 4, R4 on October 1st. So we'll, we'll ex still accept our 3 versions up through um, December 30th. So, um, again, what I said about if you query a solicitation on beta.sam, even when this is no longer the case, say it's, you know, February. We're no longer accepting R3. You can still find R3 on beta.sam and we don't want people to accidentally go to the wrong version. So we always tell you on this main schedules webpage exactly which uh, revision version we're on. But then when you go to each schedules webpage, that's where you can find um, either the zip file or the actual link to take you to that, uh, to that solicitation. Okay, so let's take a look at the standardized um, solicitation documents. And right now, all of our schedules, all of our schedule solicitations, except for 66.3, follows this format. Um, I'm working on the 66.3 refresh, um, which would put it on the standardized format as well. Um, all this information that you see in the bullets is still in the 66.3 solicitation. It's just not organized in, in this manner. So our first document, the solicitation document, document one, it includes all of the regulations. So this isn't something you fill out. This is a document you need to read and understand um, because these are what you're going to be responsible for, all these terms and conditions. The vendor response document, document two, that's one of the documents you have to fill out and return with your proposal. So anything that has a fill in, you're going to find in this, in this document. It's also got a section for commercial sales practices, past performance. If you're a large business, you'd have to um, submit a small business subcontracting plan so that there's a template in there, um, as well as a um, proposal submission checklist at the end to help you know, um, go through and make sure you got all your documents in order before you actually submit your proposal. Document three, that is an Excel file, Excel spreadsheet, the price proposal preparation, that has to be completed and returned with your offer. It has several tabs on it. Um, the first tab is the actual price proposal document. The second tab is what we call figure 515.4-2. That's where you'll um, give us information about your most favored customer. That's the person who gets the best price on each and every item or service you're offering to us. So you'll be disclosing information about your most favored customer, as well as any customer that's getting equal to or better pricing than what you're offering to the government. So there's a lot of uh, sales practice disclosures on that tab. And if you are a dealer distributor with insignificant sales, there's a tab there for some additional information you would need to, to complete. Now, the last document, the overseas delivery vendor's response document, that is optional. Um, that is only if you're offering overseas delivery. Um, a lot of people get fill in happy and will just fill in everything that there is to fill in. And then when they realize what overseas delivery entails, um, they, they don't want to do it. In all the years I've been here, I've um, actually not had anybody actually go through with um, offering overseas delivery. You're certainly welcome to offer overseas delivery. It can just get complicated when it comes to firms fixed pricing. Because since our prices are FOB destination, um, um, and in the case of overseas, you know it's FOB um, to the point of export, um, delivery times, things like that can get um, hard to manage, you know, because you've got layers of customs involved at both, you know, leaving the country and going into the next country. And so, as far as 
establishing some pricing or timeframes for delivery, it can get um, very cumbersome. Plus, when it comes to overseas delivery, um, a lot of the um, healthcare products that are used overseas are usually bought here in the US, you know, the military will buy them here, put them on ships and and, and send them over. It's 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 rarely individual um, Department of Defense locations overseas that are ordering from FSS contractors, having them, you know, shipped over. They they manage their 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 fees and 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 handle it from the US. But you're you're certainly welcome to to offer it for that opportunity and that would be the document you would use to do that. Now, for our 6212, the reference, uh, uh, the reference lab schedule and our 6063 schedule, um, there are 2 extra sections. There's a statement of work. And a technical proposal, the statement of work is just some extra information for you to read and understand uh, that will eventually be changed from a statement of work to be incorporated into the scope section. Um, we're working on the 66.3 refresh right now, so that statement of work will actually be the contents will be in a in the scope of solicitation section, and then the technical proposal that you that's actually something you complete and return with the offer, and that will be in the next year changed to a contractor responsibilities fill in section um, rather than being called the technical proposal. So now I'll turn it back over to McCall for the review and award process. Thanks, Lydia. So the contract review and award process, this section of the presentation will help you understand what happens to the information that you send in response to a solicitation. So we will start with um, the first step. Your proposal is received. So during this first step, the offer is received via our email address at vafssoffers at va.gov. So once it's received, the proposal is assigned. So the offer is routed to the applicable FSS team member or team where it is screened and then assigned to a contract specialist. Once your contract specialist is assigned, you'll receive an email from that person acknowledging receipt and touching base with you regarding the initial review of your proposal. So the next step is a cursory review and a request for information. So after the initial review of your proposal, the contract specialist will send you a clarifications letter accompanied by a missing information checklist, which will detail any deficiencies that the pro proposal um, may have um, that may require revision or uh, a clarification on your behalf. So the next step is the evaluation and um, price analysis. So the contract specialist does conduct a full evaluation and price analysis of your proposal, including market research. And after that's completed, it's time for uh, negotiations and final proposal revision request. So once this contract specialist completes the review and analysis of your offer, they will schedule a meeting with you to discuss the terms and negotiate price pricing. And this pricing will govern your FSS contract. This is followed up with the, what we call the, the FPR, the final proposal revision. And then this request, um, you'll be asked to formally propose your final offer on all pricing terms and conditions discussed during negotiations. So then there's a final review and award. So if the offer is accepted, you'll receive a VA schedule contract and you'll be eligible to start doing business with the government through the schedule program. The offer may be rejected. However, if an offer fails to meet the evaluation criteria or the contract specialist determines the pricing or terms or conditions not to be fair and reasonable, 
the rejection, um, the the offer is rejected, and you'll get a no award. Um, this may also happen in earlier stages of the proposal review process. If the offer is uh, substantially deficient and you're unable to uh, provide proper clarification. Next slide. So we like to award contracts within PALT and that stands for procurement action lead time. And usually that's 180 days beginning after an offer is deemed accurate and complete. And that's 240 days for service contracts or service offers. That time frame may be shorter or longer depending on the completeness and the complexity of the offer and the workload of the contract specialist uh, assigned to your offer. Offers that must be reviewed by the VA Office of um, Inspector General gen generally exceeds more than uh, 180 days. So that is all that I have for the review and award process. I am turning it back over to Lydia. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna look at are contractor responsibilities. So I'm going to show you a couple of charts here that are on um, a contractor responsibilities webpage. So where you see here, it says recurring requirements. That's a link to the webpage and you're going to see this chart. And when you're on the webpage, each one of these items under the what column is a link to more information about that item. So this chart here talks about the, the repeating requirements you have while you're maintaining your, your federal supply schedule contract. It tells you who it applies to, and it tells you when or how often it applies. So for example, if you look at the second line there, SAM, the system for award management, everybody has to comply with this requirement. Uh, and it happens both pre-award and annually. So you have to register with SAM prior to submitting an offer. That's a condition of your submitting an offer. But then once you have a contract, you have to update or renew your registration at SAM at least once a year in order to maintain an active status. Second one you see there, VETS 4212, all contractors have to abide by that. But when you see the when, it's not a pre-award requirement. This is a post-award requirement. It's required of contractors. So until you have a contract, you're not required to file this report. But once you have a contract, you have to file this report each year by September by September 30th. So I'll show you here re the recurring requirements link on our page. So this takes you to the main contractor responsibilities page where we have a marketing, little marketing section here. And here's this chart, recurring requirements. And you can see how you can click on each and every one of these to file out, find more information. So for example, service contract reporting, you click on that and you'll get more information on that, what the applicable regulations are, what the requirements are, when are the due dates. And here you can see, if I scroll up, these different requirements, these different um, expand, expanding information on each one of these requirements. I just talked about VETS 4212. It tells you what regulation requires it, what the actual requirement is, when it's due, a little summary of what it is. This is about affirmative action, EEO1 reports. So each and every one of these is explained uh, more in depth on our on our on our website. So the second chart we have on our web page, other contract policies and obligations. Again, if you click on this hyperlink, it'll take you to that. And you'll see this chart where each and every one of these, when you go to that chart, will also be um, a hyperlink to more information. Um, minimum sales contract criteria, McCall mentioned this previously about the $25,000 criteria. Your company has to be able to um, have at least $25,000 in sales during the first 24 months of your contract. In the beginning, we give you two years to get $25,000 in sales, but then every year after that, you have to have 25,000 years uh, a year in sales to maintain that FSS contract. So if you don't think you'll be able to meet that minimum, or we don't think you'll be able to meet that minimum, we wouldn't be able to award you an FSS contract. Uh, next one you see here, modifications. 
as a scheduled contractor, you may need to modify your contract after it's been awarded. So this section gives you information on how to submit requests for modification that your assigned contract specialist would review and work with you towards approval. Um, some modifications may be triggered by actual policy requirements that require you to submit a modification whenever certain things happen, um, but other things are optional. You need to, um, or, or, or based on what you need, you need to update a point of contact. You need to submit a modification to update that point of contact, things like that. We also issue something called mass modifications, and that's when we need to make um, uh, changes to scheduled terms and conditions across the board to anybody awarded under that specific um, contract. Price reductions, that right there would give you more information about um, the price reductions clause that's in your contract, where um, there are certain um, criteria and rules about um, when you're required to um, submit a, a price reduction to lower your prices to, to, to federal supply schedule. Talk about extensions and cancellation, um, because our, our schedules are awarded with a five-year base. Five year base period, um, but then you have an option for an extended five year period, making a total of 10 years for your FSS contract. Now, the only exception to this is our 66 3 schedule. It actually has three five year options for a potential of 20 years. And then our 65 1 B schedule, the pharmaceutical schedule, um, it doesn't by policy exercise a five year option. There is a five year base, um, but we require a new follow on offer be submitted once that first five year period um, has is is coming is coming to an end. We will offer ex, uh, many extensions while an offer is being negotiated. So there still is a potential if something were to go wrong and it were to take a, you know, a number of years to get a, a new contract in place, but um, but it does not have that that five year option. One of the important things I want to point out on here is the manufacturer letter of supply. So if you are a dealer or distributor, not the manufacturer, you would be required to submit a letter of supply from any manufacturer whose products you're, you're offering in order to assure us that there's going to be a source of supply sufficient to satisfy the government's requirements and to prove to us that the manufacturer has actually given you permission to sell your products on a government contract. So what you have to keep in mind is that while the manufacturer may give you permission to sell your products commercially, there are times when manufacturers, when it comes to a government contract, will say no. They do not want you selling your pro products as a dealer distributor on a government contract. A lot, of, a lot of times it's because they have their own government contract as the manufacturer and don't want to have additional dealers and distributors with um, other contract, other FSS contracts selling the same products. So you need to make sure before you ever start the process that the manufacturer will in fact allow you to um, offer your products on an FSS contract. And we would need to see that, um, that letter of supply. Price, there's various priceless requirements that you'd have to keep up with um, throughout the contract period. Uh, the maximum order um, information um, is established by schedule in some place, sometimes by SIN category. And then that last thing, the government purchase card, um, there's a clause in the solicitation 52232-36, payment by third party, which requires you to accept the credit card for all for all payments. So if we go to that other contract policies and obligations link, um, takes you again to that main contract responsibilities page, but you scroll down to that section and you can click on each and every one of those, um, those topics for more information on each one. So let's talk about the resources we're gonna leave you with. Any of the links we've provided in the, throughout the presentation are all gonna be on these last resources slide. Um, we talked about beta.sam.gov where solicitations are posted, but right now you are not going to go there and query and try and find a solicitation. You're always going to go to our schedule pages to find the link, either the link to the solicitation on FedBiz, I'm sorry, on beta.sam, or actually download that zip file. That way you can be assured you're getting the right version. This is the link to our homepage. I'll let you take a look at this. Um, on our homepage, um, the easiest way to navigate is to look at these tabs. This is information about schedules, a tab for contractors, tab for customers. Customers would mean the people that are ordering against our contract. 
Um, so on each of these tabs, you're going to see a word cloud at the bottom to help get you directly to um, one of the pages you need. You see those word clouds for each of our pages. Contractors, this is information about business size. There's that contractor responsibilities page that we, we just um, went over. Talking about marketing, here's where your modification forms are. So the word clouds will help you navigate. Also, regardless of which tab you're on, you'll see these main important links on the right hand side resources. So VA schedule programs that gets you straight to that page. I showed you where every schedule is listed. And each schedule number is a hyperlink to that specific schedule page where you can then get more information about the schedule and download that solicitation. Um, also on this resources on the, the right hand side, we talked about, or McCall mentioned that when you submit your offer to us to that email address that's listed, it told you to make sure you go to this section here, electronic acceptance of offers and proposals, because when you go to that section, it's going to give you more information about how you need to submit it. Like we don't accept zip files. If it's going to, you know, this is the the limit and how many megabytes can be in one email. So if you have to submit multiple emails to submit an offer, this is how you need to do it. So there's subject line information, how you do your attachments, um, basic information like that. Uh, prospective contractors. So that's that's you. So this gives you a lot of information that some of it's also included in the read me first section of our solicitation document. So it'll give you basic information about becoming a prospective contractor. Is contract right for you? What we talked about today. Um, do you qualify? What are the next steps? Um, other recommendations. And then these sections here take you to information for current contractors as well as federal customers. Training, our training page, that's going to um, uh, post like previous, uh, previous um, presentations we've done. The last industry day we held was 2019 before COVID, and so some of the presentations are there. We periodically um, have webinars, and so we'll post whenever there's upcoming webinars, what some of the more recent presentations were that we've done, some of the archived presentations. Um, a very valuable resource on this training page for you is prospective contractors solicitation assistance. So if you go to the solicitation assistance library, um, it's going to have very valuable documents for you. Um, one of them is the, so when you do it, you'll click open, is the um, guide to the vendor response document. Um, the contractor's guide to CSP, the offer's guide to vendor response documents. So this document will actually take you step by step through our vendor response document and give you helpful hints on um, what you should or shouldn't do when answering questions. So um, our, uh, McCall mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this was the beginner version. Well, our intermediate version of this, this um, presentation actually will take you through some of this. So just as an example, when filling out this one form, the signatory authority form, there's a lot of things that can go wrong where we have to ask for clarification because something was misunderstood or not completed correctly. So we always try to point out. So when it comes to block one, don't click initial. This tells you revision should only be, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to click initial. Revision is only checked if you're making corrections after you've been awarded a contract. Block number four, Leave this blank because this is an offer. You don't have a contract number yet. Even if you have a contract now and are submitting an offer for a new contract, the new contract's gonna have a new contract number. So whenever you're submitting an offer, you would always leave that blank. Um, it also provides helpful, cro helpful cross-references because sometimes what you check here needs to match where you check somewhere else. Um, so we'll point those things out because that's another thing that we frequently see when we're reviewing offers is that they've indicated one thing in one place, but then when you go to the other place, it says something different. So we don't know which one is correct. So this, this guide is designed to help um, cut down on those errors when you submit a um, federal supply schedule offer. And McCall mentioned that, you know, it's possible that your proposal could be returned or no awarded either at the, towards the end of the process or during the process. This document here, no award proposal deficiencies, 
it outlines all the different types of scenarios or most of the different types of scenarios that could arise that could cause your your um, your award your offer to be no awarded. So this zip file that you would um, be able to select here from the solicitation assistance library is very valuable for you um, to help um, make that proposal high and tight and have the least amount of clarification and make it a more expeditious review for the contract specialist. Um, then there's information on the training page for schedule contractors, government customers. It also gives you some information on training that other um, other agencies or other organizations would offer information on GSA Interact training, SBA's training, and PTACs. Those are your um, procurement technical assistance centers. They're the ones that help small businesses with um, problems they encounter when trying to, to work with the government for contracts. So the VA Schedules program page, we've gone over that. Um, I linked you to the prospective contractors page that was on the right-hand side of that um, web page. Getting on schedule is another um, um, another layer of um, prospective contractors because um, we talked about the prospective contractors link here. Getting on schedule schedule kind of continues that process. Talking about the solicitation packages I did, what are the elements of a successful offer, the review and award process as McCall described. Electronic acceptance of offers, we went to that link that was also on that right hand side of our main web page that gives you all the logistics for submitting a, a proposal, um, how you submit it, what the megabyte limits are in the email. This is that main contract responsibilities page that has all the uh, all the information about the recurring requirements and other other post award um, and pre award requirements. This is a direct link to the training page I just showed you that includes webinars. And this valuable guide that I just um, just uh, went over, the valuable guides, that vendor response document, commercial sales practices, um, filling out that figure 515.4-2 on the spreadsheet can be very complicated. And this guide breaks it down and um, gives you actual scenarios. Um, if, if your product um, or your discounting practices are this way, this is how you would fill it out. If your discounting practices are this way, this is how you would complete this figure. Um, and then I mentioned our help desk where if you had some issues with um, determining, I think my product fits in the scope of the schedule, but I'm not sure. I think it fits under the send category, but I'm not sure if, if you have questions about scope um, or just general questions about our program, you can go to that FSS help desk. So um, that concludes our part of the presentation. So I will turn it back over to uh, to Curtis now. Thank you so much, um, Lydia. I have a few questions. Do we have time to answer a few questions? Yes. Okay. First question. Was good morning. Just wondering if there were any accounts for security officers or any investigations. Did you say accounts for security? Yes. Um, I'm not sure what's meant by accounts. Uh, um, or, or investigations. The, the only thing that comes into play when it comes to, I guess, investigations would be under our 621I temporary healthcare staffing schedule um, because the contractor would have to make sure that any of the um, temporary staffing individuals they're sending out have, have, have met these certain background investigations and things like that. And always at the ordering activity level, they can have security requirements and security clearance requirements that could certainly come into play. But that would only be dealing with our, um, with our services schedules. Um, there's no like background investigation involved with any of our commodities or, or products related schedules. I'm not sure if that answers the question because it referenced accounts, but. Um, Hey, Lydia, you still there? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, next question, do we have to have been in business for a certain time to compete for these contracts? No, there used to be a two-year limit and we took that off, uh, wow, I'm, 
I'm not even sure how long ago it was, maybe six, seven years ago or something like that. Um, but what we are looking for is that you can meet that um, minimum sales requirement. So a lot of businesses that are just getting up and started can't meet that $25,000 a year. So that's where there might be an issue. Um, we also might have issue with establishing fair and reasonable pricing if it's a brand new company, because um, there might be difficulties if they don't have um, significant sales yet. Um, and it, it can be problematic when um, trying to establish fair and reasonable pricing or most favored customer pricing, as well as when it comes to our price reductions clause, it, it, it's problematic for finding um, uh, a customer that we can track in the future for um, maintaining fair and reasonable pricing through the price reductions clause. But there, there, there is no time limit except under 621I, uh, our temporary healthcare staffing schedule. They, um, I'd have to double check, but I do believe they, ha they still have that two year. That they're the only schedule that still has that two year requirement in place. Thank you. He also asked about competing for contracts. Um, we, we don't, um, you don't have to compete for a contract with FSS. As we said in, in the presentation, our, our solicitations are open and continuous. So when you want to reply to the solicitation, um, you can, you're not in competition with anyone. Yeah, so to elaborate on that, um, you, uh, as many contractors as can offer fair and reasonable pricing can be on a federal supply schedule. So we might have 10 contractors offering the exact same item where you are sort of, you're not competing at the base of this contract level to get an, to get a contract awarded. You would compete at the order level though. Um, you know, this ordering office wants to buy this item and there's 10 of you out there on FSS selling the same item in that case. Now it's, you know, the 10 of you competing for that 1 specific order, but to get the emphasis contract. No, you're not competing against each other. But when we look at um, your pricing to determine if your pricing is fair and reasonable, we are going to look at um, 1 of the slides showed the different layers that we look at um, to, to determine fair and reasonable pricing. Because without being able to determine fair and reasonable pricing, you can't have an FSS contract. So we're looking at most favored customer pricing. One of the things, are you giving us equal to or better pricing than what you offer your best customer? Um, there may be reasons why we're not entitled to that pricing, but we look at that as well. We're also going to look at um, how does your pricing fare when we look at other FSS contractors? Is it within the range? So if there's eight other contractors offering the same item for, you know, anywhere from 90 cents to a dollar and you're trying to offer it for a dollar 50, even if it's your most favorite customer price, it's the best price you offer. We, we can easily recognize that no one would order your item because it's so far out of the, you know, the competitive range of what's already on federal supply schedule. So you, that's why, you know, McCall talked about, it's important to do your market research and see, um, what else was out there in terms of um, other contract pricing. Um, and the third thing we look at is commercial market pricing. So maybe there aren't other FSS contractors selling your same item, but commercially your item is sold by a lot of other contractors. Well, again, if the, in the commercial market, everyone's selling it for 90 cents to a dollar, but you wanna put it on schedule for $1.50, it wouldn't matter if it's your best price because an ordering activity would basically say, well, why would I order off an FSS contract? I can go open market and buy it from one of these commercial, you know, commercial offered contracts, um, contractors for 90 cents to a dollar. So that's why it's important to do your research and make sure um, you're within that in that range. So you're not competing at the base FSS contract level, but we do look to make sure that you're going to fit within that competitive range. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless for you to have the, uh, the FSS contract. Thank you. Do any of these schedules include professional services beyond health specializations? So, for example, organizational, leadership, strategy, coaching, consulting. So that would be anything that's not healthcare related is is GSA's federal supply schedule. They have it used to be a bunch of different schedules. Now it's one single schedule they call mass multiple award schedules, and they have, I know they have professional services and temporary staffing. Um, um, so that's where you would look under GSA's mass schedule. Um, and actually, um, let me scroll back up. One of McCole's slides talked about these places to do your market research. Um, the NAT contract catalog search to CCST, that was just where we have all of our VAFSS product and pricing information there. 
but GSA eLibrary, that's kind of like the yellow pages for federal supply schedule for VA and, FS and GSA FSS. So if you go to GSA eLibrary, I'll show you. It's not very clear when you go on this uh, where to go because there's a lot of stuff here. So you're going to go to view schedule contracts over here on the right. And when you do that, there's GSA's multiple award schedule contract right there. I'm hey, sorry. Hey, Lydia, real quick. We're not seeing your uh, what you're trying to show. We're just seeing the, the presentation. Stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I, have sorry. To, I have to share again. I'm so sorry. Let me. Um, let me do that again. I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking. Uh, okay. Okay. Got it now. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. So GSA e library, that's the yellow pages for all FSS, GSA and VA FSS, uh, schedule contracts. So when you go here, like I said, there's a lot of stuff here who would know where to go. So just <laughs> remember, go to the top right corner, view schedule contracts. Now there's all of our schedules right there and GSA. They used to have a whole long listing. This thing used to go on for pages. Now it's one single schedule, multiple award schedule. So when you go to GSAs, you'll see each category. These are their SIN categories, the special item number categories I was talking about. So for each SIN category, you'll see all kinds of information about that category, um, facility solutions. So somewhere in this really, really long list will be like some staffing stuff. Um, office furniture, package furniture, human resources. There's some stuff there, uh, breaks it down, social services, um, different types of things. And when you're on any one of these, if let's say you're interested in this category here, total solutions for facilities management. If you click on any category, in any SIN category, it'll immediately tell you every single contractor that has items awarded under that SIN category. And you can go directly to GSA Advantage to view their catalog, you can view their terms and conditions. So that applies to our schedules as well. See our schedules here. So let's say for 652, say 652 F page mobility devices. These are our special item number categories or SIN categories. These are the different wheelchairs I told you about manual, powered, scooters, stand up wheelchairs, wheelchair cushions. Let's say you mark, you have walkers. Well, I want to know on my market research, who else has walkers on schedule? So I click on that category. Now I can see everybody that's awarded the VA FSS contract with walkers on their, on their schedule. And I can view their catalog on GSA Advantage. I can view their terms and conditions and price lists, things like that. Um, when you go to GSA Advantage, you can either link from where I just showed you or, or go straight there. That's the Amazon.com of government shopping where ordering activities can can go in and say okay i'll have one of these and two of those and put them in their um put them in their cart so let's say this is obviously going to get a million hits because it's bandages but um if i knew what specific kind of bandage and was able to drill it down like uh and i'm the ordering person i can go on here and say oh okay these three companies offer this type of bandage so this one offers it at this price this one offers it at this price um, so either they can just straight put it in their cart and check out and order straight from the company this way, or they, they can go through what's called e-buy where they, um, where they can say there's five contractors offering this specific type of bandage. They could compete it against the five people say, okay, I, I need, I need a thousand boxes of these. Which one of you can give me the best price? So you can even get um, get um, queries that way when you have a have an FSS contract. But this is good for you to do your research when you're trying to find out where do my product prices fit in because you can put your product in the search. You know, just like with Amazon or anything else, you can further narrow it down on the side by different things to see where your product or pricing fits in. Hey, Lydia, thanks for that um, response. So we've got time for one more question. Um, the, the, the time was well spent. If I could ask that, uh, if you do have a question, still know that uh, we will pull these down. Lydia, if I can ask that my team send those over to you so that after uh, the event, if you could reply back to those individuals, that would be great. But this has been extremely helpful um, as, as observed by the amount of questions, just really the appetite by the audience to really you know, dig into this and see how this can really help them uh, grow their company. So, uh, Curtis, let's get one more question, then we'll cut across the field. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Do SDVO 
do SDV or SVs get preferential awards on the FSS schedule or is it open to low bid? So when it comes to being awarded an FSS contract, um, there's no preference for any business type because our contracts are used by all government agencies and the vets first program that is a VA only program. So the only time a vet can get preference is under a VA order. So at the base FSS contract level, there's no distinction between one business type and another. At the ordering level, however, um, and again, it's only for VA orders because that's the only thing Vets First applies to. That's where you would get um, preference, where they have to try to um, fulfill the rule of um, the rule of two. Um, but keep in mind, even if that means there's two or more Vets that can offer this product. They have to be offered at fair and reasonable pricing. So if they're way outside the range of what other people offer it, you know, that vet's preference doesn't doesn't hold. So um, you, that's why it's extremely important that you take a look at the pricing that you, you put in place. Thanks for that, Lydia. Uh, appreciate that. So, Curtis, if you can just go ahead and give us the um, wrap up comment and then we'll conclude the session. Absolutely. Thank you for everybody attending today. Um, please feel free to reach out and um, to to Osdevu if you would like us, you know, to supply you with any resources or information. Please complete the survey at the end of this uh, webinar. Let us know how we did, and I hope everybody have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you.